Hello, this is the second topic in Unit 1 of Higher Biology. So we looked at DNA structure before, we're now going to get on to the replication or the copying of DNA. So to begin with, I want you to write down um, answers to those. So a bit of revision from National 5. So first of all, state when DNA replication occurs. So when a chromosome is copied, think back to what you did last year. And then number two, describe why DNA replication occurs. So pause, write some stuff down and then come back. So here we go. Hopefully this had you thinking about mitosis. So when did, uh, when does it occur? So it occurs during mitosis. So it's that first stage there when you've got the, the chromosomes being copied before the, um, before we have them lining up on the equator of the cell. So that's when it occurs during mitosis. And the reason why it happens is to ensure that all the genetic information is passed on to new cells. So part of cell division um, and it's so that your new cells have all the same genetic information so they can make the the appropriate proteins. And just as a bit of a revision of that, so you know what we're kind of where we are and what we're doing, and you can put this in context a wee bit, you can have a look at this Twig video clip. So as ever you can log into Twig through a uh, glow and search for mitosis. So learning intentions for this uh, part, and again, you might want to split this video into two or three bits, depending on how you're placed. Um, but the kind of main, the, the majority of this, of, of what the required knowledge is in this slide. So describe the stages of DNA replication um, by DNA polymerase, ASE at the end there. So that would make you think that that is an enzyme. Two new words coming up. So explain the role of a primer. In DNA replication. Three, describe the differences in replication on the two DNA strands, then we're going to call them the leading and the lagging strands. And then number four, explain the role of ligase ESE, so another enzyme, explain the role of ligase in DNA replication. So first of all, in order for DNA replication to occur, you require a number of things. So first of all is the DNA molecule itself, so your DNA double helix and you're going to use that as a template to make your new DNA strands. Second of all you've got your free DNA nucleotides so remember your nucleotides from the first topic so your uh, deoxyribose sugar, your base and your phosphate so you need, um, you need those with your different bases. Primers which and that's a new word which came up in the um, came up during the learning intentions nothing to do with painting which a lot of people are doing just now but these are um, in terms of DNA replication these are short strands of DNA so think of them as like ATTGCA or something like that short DNA strands and they're used as a starting point for replication and also enzymes and do you remember them from learning intentions they are DNA polymerase and ligase so we're going to go through the stages um, in your notes, which you may have may or may not have cop uh, printed out, you've certainly got digital access anyway. Um, you'll have these written out, and here is the first stage. So the first thing that happens is the DNA unwinds. So you can see um, on the left. On the left here, it has unwound. And um, you've got hydrogen bonds, remember, between the bases. They have broken and you've now what's called a replication fork is opened up. So DNA unwinds. Here is the second stage. So remember we mentioned that you need a primer to start off the process. So this is where it gets involved. And for this, you need to remember the orientation. Remember drawing out your, your two strands and you had... Uh, the three prime end at the top of one and the three prime end was at the bottom of the other one. So it's like an important level of detail here. You've got the primers involved, 
and the primers bind to a specific part of the DNA molecule, so or the DNA strand, they, they bind to the three prime end. So primers bind to the three prime end of each strand, and we call these the leading and the lagging strand. Okay, and the primers are required to start replication. Okay, the next stage is the DNA polymerase, or enzyme. It adds on nucleotides to the three prime end of the primers. So to get that right in your head. So you've got the three prime end of the, the DNA strand, which the primers have bound to. So if you look at my wee red dot here, that's the three prime end. But then if that's the three prime end of the DNA strand, then that is the five prime end of the primer. I'll say that again. So that's the three prime end of the DNA strand here in blue. The primer, well, that's going to be non-parallel, isn't it, to anti-parallel. So that's going to be the five prime end of the primer. The three prime end of the primer is down here. And nucleotides are added on to the three prime end of the primer. So in this strand, the leading strand, it's added in that way. Okay. And the leading strand, um, can the nucleotides are added continuously. And that is because this uh, replication fork is continuing to open up. So imagine these, these wound bits of DNA they're opening up as the nucleotides are being added on. Okay, so that's in the leading strand, you get replication continuously. On this strand though, it's a little bit more of an issue because what you've got is, you can see that the primer is always added on to the three prime end. So what happens then is you're having these um, nucleotides being added on only in fragments. So you've got primer coming in, another primer coming in, another primer coming in, and then added on to the, the three prime end. Okay, so the nucleotides have to be produced in fragments on the on the lagging strand. So it's kind of just looking at a picture, it's just a tricky image to get into your head, but we'll have a look at an animation shortly, uh, which should make you kind of, you can visualise it a bit better. But the kind of take home message is, uh, primers, um, the DNA polymerase adds nucleotides to three prime end of the primer, and on one of the strands you've got continuous replication, whereas in the other um, you've got fragments being produced. Okay, and on that, on the lagging strand, you then have the enzyme ligase becoming involved, so it joins together the fragments on the on the on the lagging strand. I just one other thing to mention. I mean, we, we've, you know, when talking about DNA, we know that we've we've got a, a huge amount of it within even just one cell. And in the first topic, we talked about in order how in order to fit it all in, it's wrapped around proteins called histones. Well, if you think about it, you know, if you were just had one piece of DNA and one chromosome, and you were just um, going from the bottom to the top of the chromosome, it would take an awful long time to copy. So, what actually happens in reality is you get these little replication bubbles, so the DNA is being um, produced at various different points, and then eventually they all they all come together. Okay. So I'd like you to have a look at this. So this is if you just uh, oh I'm trying to think how, how do you get to this? If you if you just do a Google search for DNA replication animation, hopefully it's one of the first ones that comes up. I don't have the link at hand, but. And what I'm trying to show you, and you know, it doesn't have to be this animation necessarily, but what I want you to just see is the difference between the replication on the two strands. So one of them added continuously as it opens up, as as the replication fork binds up, whereas the other one it's been added in the opposite direction, so it has to keep doing it in little fragments. So here is a little exercise we would be doing in class with my blue, yellow, red, green paper clips. I'm thinking it's possibly unlikely you're going to have um, diff different colour paper clips knocking about the house. Um, so what you could do instead is just draw this, uh, write it out. So big bit of paper and just write out your letters here and just follow it through. And hopefully you'll have a wee drawing that kind of shows how DNA replication occurs and the differences between the two strands. Um, okay, so have a go, have a pause and have a, a go at that and see if you can draw it out.
Uh, so to begin with, if you have a in, for this next lesson, if you go to YouTube and search for DNA crash course, I think it's about an eight nine minute video, and it just takes you through the takes you through the stages with the primer and and DNA polymerase ligase and so on. So go and have a look at that. Okay, next little task. You know, again, you know, I'm always trying to emphasise my classes. The important thing is to, you know, have your notes away from you and try and and reproduce things from memory. So, again, big bit of paper. What I'd like you to do is have four boxes on it, and each of them is those stages that we talked about before. So the unwinding of the DNA and so on, hydrogen bonds breaking, all the way through to um, the action of ligase. So I want to try and draw what happens at each stage and to try and help you again, I try and try and do it from memory, not looking at your notes. But I've given you um, some words there to help you. So primer, five prime end, three prime end. Um, so go away and and uh, have a go at that and see if you see if again you can you can draw out the stages of DNA replication um, and then have a look at your notes or the previous slides in this to see if you've see if you've got it correct. So the next little bit of this topic is a process which humans use and they've really taken advantage of DNA replication um, in order to in order, in order to, to let's get various uses basically. Um, and this is PCR. Um, so you need to stay what PCR is and describe the process. So, I don't know why this slide is here. <laughs> so, polymerase chain reaction, so that is uh, PCR. So, PCR is short for polymerase chain reaction. So, it's a technique, and the purpose of it is to amplify DNA um, in vitro. So, in vitro means outside a living thing. So, it produces large quantities of DNA. Which can then be used for analysis, and I think the best way you know people tend to remember this is through crime scenes. So if you've got a, a small amount of DNA found at a crime scene, there's not enough of it to analyse. So enough of it for analysis. So what you do is you take that small piece of DNA and you use PCR to amplify it, and then you've got enough to carry out analysis. And the kind of analogy for it is it's like finding a needle in the haystack. This is your forensics, and you use that needle then to produce a haystack of needles. So you produce that very small amount of DNA, you then use to produce a large amount of DNA. So this was Kerry Mullis, he was the inventor of PCR and won the Nobel Prize um, for the invention. So have a look at this uh, YouTube film. So this is um, the polymerase chain reaction. And uh, yeah, just do a Google search for that and it will take you through the stages. And then I will um, talk you through them myself. So first stage, and there are certain similarities with the process of DNA replication itself, so just try and get them separated into your head. So DNA replication is a natural process, whereas PCR is something which is done in the lab to produce large quantities of DNA. So first stage, so we're going to have a heating cooling cycles. So the DNA is heated to 94 degrees Celsius, and the purpose of that is to break the hydrogen bonds between base pairs and separate the two strands. Okay, so heat separates your two DNA strands. Stage number two, you bring the temperature back down. So the DNA is cooled to 55 degrees Celsius. And at this point, remember what you, you need to start DNA replication. You need to complement, you need primers. So complementary primers bind to each end of the target sequence to be amplified. So when talking about a target sequence here, what we're looking at, um, you might be a you know a gene which is involved in cystic fibrosis or something of interest 
um, is being specifically targeted and primers have been made to target that sequence. Okay, so stage two, DNA cooled and the primers then bind. And you can think about your knowledge of DNA replication, what's going to happen next. So, and uh, yeah, I should mention as well, you've got two different primers, one for each strand. We then put the temperature back up again. So primers have bound at 55 degrees C. We then heat the DNA back up to 72 degrees Celsius. And you have a heat tolerant DNA polymerase and it's gonna add on nucleotides. And remember that is to the three prime end of each primer. And then stage number four, you've got your two identical copies of DNA produced. Okay, so temperature went up back down, up again, and you've now got your copies of DNA. So that's two copies at this point, you've gone from one to two. And what happens next is you just repeat it for a number of hours. So stages one to four, the heating cooling cycle are repeated many times. And after, as I said, a couple of hours, you're gonna have billions of copies of your targets, target DNA sequence, which you can do um, whatever you like with it, whatever type of analysis. So if you, again, I don't know if you can, if you go into OneDrive and certainly click on the, the PowerPoint for this, you'll get the link to it. Um, if you just do a Google search as well, you, if you do virtual lab PCR, um, there's a really good animation online which you can go through the, go through the stages and that allows you to put things in in little um, test tubes and so on. So go away and have a look at that and that'll um, hopefully kind of improve your knowledge of this. So use the OneDrive PowerPoint or if you can Google it and find it, have a look through this PCR virtual lab. So moving on to the, the uses of PCR and crime scenes is what kind of um, sticks in everybody's mind um, for uses of PCR. So the first thing is DNA fingerprinting or forensic forensics, which is to help solve crimes. So if you look at the picture here, we've got some crime scene medicine evidence, some blood, which perhaps is the suspicion I presume is that it's um, the perpetrator of the crime, is, it belongs to them. So what you can do is take that away, amplify it, and then there are various sequences of DNA which are unique to individuals. So here's the analysis, and what's happened is you've got a match with suspect B. Um, suspect A looks kind of looks as if he's been in lockdown, doesn't he, for a while. Um, suspect B, um, he's the one that's got the match, so he would be. Um, you've got evidence of him being at the crime scene. That that blood is belongs to him. So that's one use, DNA fingerprinting. And if we were in the class, and hopefully we will, we'll, I'll be able to show you this at some point, but the kind of origin of um, DNA profiling was this guy called Alec Jeffries, and there was, um, like, there was, there was uh, murders that happened in the 1980s in England, and he, they were struggling to find um, who it was who was carrying out the crimes. And using his sort of brand new technology, he was able to um, he, he was able to identify um, people who were at, who were at crime scenes, and um, yeah, it's really sort of revolutionized revolutionized um, how police go about trying to solve crimes. So that was Alec Jeffries in the the nineteen eighties. Um, another potential use of this is diagnosing genetic disorders. So. Um, cystic fibrosis, for example, people unfortunately with cystic fibrosis don't tend to live particularly long and maybe until the age of 40, some will die in their 30s unfortunately. So um, if you were carrying that, the gene for cystic fibrosis, then you know, like there's the kind of morality, you know, the, there's a kind of moral question and there's a question for individuals as to whether you want to know or not. I mean, that's something we'll, we'll discuss a bit in class, whether you want to know. Um, if you have got genetic diseases, but that's something which can be done um, using PCR, so diagnose genetic disorders. Probably the most famous um, instance of this in the news is through Angelina Jolie, so um, the actress. So Angelina Jolie's uh, mother, unfortunately, died of cancer at the age of 56. 
um, and it was discovered that there's a defective gene, it is up here, B BRCA1, and if you've got that, then you've got uh, an 87% an chance of developing breast cancer um, and also ovarian cancer. So Angelina Jolie found that uh, she had this gene um, inherited from her mother, um, so she had surgery, um, which meant that the I think it was a mastectomy. I don't know if it was a hysterectomy as well, um, which is obviously quite significant operations. But you know, it reduced the chance of her developing breast breast cancer from eighty seven percent to five percent. So, you know, this is something which can, um, yeah, improve improve people's quality of life and reduce their their, their risk of disease. Uh, something else. PCR can be used for is paternity testing, so to determine the biological father of a child. So you get you get fifty percent of your DNA from your mom and fifty percent from your dad. Um, and here's a kind of very simple diagram, but there's a mother's DNA profile and the child's DNA profile, and then you can see there's a match here with the alleged father. Whereas with this one, the child's DNA profile here, this is coming from the mom, but the one that um, the, the alleged father is not a match. Okay. This, is, you know, sometimes I put slides in and I forget why I've why I've done it. Um. So this is a Spice Girl, Melanie. I can't remember what the letter is that comes after Melanie, but this is one of the Spice Girls. This guy on the right here is Eddie Murphy, and she claimed that Eddie Murphy was the father of her child. He denied it. They did the genetic tests and it was true. So, yeah, an example of PCR being used for paternity testing. Now, this will look familiar. I've only just added this in fairly recently. Uh, so this is COVID-19 testing. And PCR has been in, in the news because it has been used to test for the coronavirus. So what happens is samples are taken from the nose um, the inside the nose, obviously the mucus within the nose, and also the the also the tonsils, and that sample is taken away, and the P PCR is used to replicate the small amounts of virus which are found either on the tonsils or within the sort of nasal cavity, and you can get a positive or negative result within three hours, which is pretty quick. I think obviously tests have been developed to try and make it an even quicker process. But yeah, PCR has been important in sort of fight against the coronavirus, which has been happening this year. Um, just to show you something related to this, which might come, come up in the exam. So um, what you've got here is uh, gel electrophoresis. So it's not quite DNA, but you've got um, it's this idea of kind of separating, separating species by their genetics. So what you'd have is kind of standard protein, um, and what they're looking to see is using that how related different species are, and the more matches there are, then the more closely related they are. Okay, so if, just to to make you aware, this is something you might see. So you get gel electrophoresis to separate DNA fragments. Here it's separating protein fragments. But essentially, the more matches you have with between species, then the more closely related they are. So if you look at um, species two and species four, they are. Oh, they look identical there, don't they? Um, whereas you've got differences with the other species. So just to finish this off, um, here's something for you to have a go at. So this is covers topics, a good part of the knowledge required for the first topics 1.1 and 1.2. Um, so see if you can do this. Um, I should say as well, I would recommend drawing things for this, the structure of DNA. Don't just do, you know, you could do the descriptive, but um, if you, a good label drawing will get you marks. And similarly for replication of DNA, you can describe the stages, one, two, three, four, but a drawing um, beside it would be, will get you marks as well. So pause this, have a go at that, and then I'll show you the answers. So here's the marks for this. So first thing you should say for the DNA structure is that um, you've got a double strand of nucleotides, or it's a double helix. You've got deoxyribose sugar, phosphate, and base. And if you've drawn that out and labelled it correctly, then you get a mark. 
sugar phosphate backbone, you get a mark. Uh, you might not necessarily thought a number four, but because um, it's a bit nat five, isn't it? But you've got complementary bases, or A goes with T, C goes with G. There's hydrogen bonds between bases, and another mark for saying that there's an anti-parallel structure with deoxyribose and phosphate at the three prime and five prime ends. And again, if you've just done a drawing of um, the nucleotides and the two strands, then you would get you would get your marks for that if it was labelled correctly. And you can also say the DNA is wrapped around um, histones or packaged with proteins would be okay. So for that first part, um, five marks from that. Then on to the second part, which is your DNA replication. So you get a mark, mark for saying that DNA unwinds into two strands. You get a mark for saying a primer is needed to start replication. Number 10, DNA polymerase as nucleotides to three prime end of uh, each strand. And then the nucleotides are added in one direction. A mark for saying one strand is replicated continuously and the other is in fragments. And then a mark for saying that the fragments are joined together by ligase. So that is the end of the topic.